going to talk about a cat that goes to prison with four or five years, he's getting out in like two by the time he gets to federal prison, and he blows it. You know, he does what Troy Kell says, right? He Fs his life off. He Fs his life off with another 35-year sentence. He becomes a missile. You know, you always get these young dudes that come into prison and they believe all the stuff that they've seen in movies and stuff that they heard, and they look up to these dudes who really are a bunch of, you know, for lack of better terms, nobodies. Dudes that don't really care about you, man. Dudes that will let you go ahead and throw your whole life away. This is about a kid named David Frank Jennings. He's at an FCI. So those of you that think that, you know, you go to a medium security prison, you're good, you're going to be all right. Man, violence is at every step of the way inside this system. Numerous people just this month brutalized in federal prison. USP Hazleton, USP Big Sandy, two bodies at Hazleton this month. Call up like 16 people off to the hospital at Big Sandy. It's, it's like nonstop. It's a rotating door, man, where even the strong don't survive. It's a machine. It's like a wood chipper. You put it in, it chews you up and spits you out. And then nobody ever remembers you. That's probably what happened with David. No one remembers Dave. They remember the story. But no one remembers him in the sense of all the dudes that were urging him to handle that business, brother. Nobody thinks about Dave now. Nobody probably sends him commissary from back then. Nobody probably writes Dave a letter. Nobody accepts Dave's phone call. Man went to prison at 26. Now he's going to get out when he's 62. But he was supposed to get out, I think, when he was 28. Threw his whole life away. But this is Dave's story. Let's get into it. On November 4th, 2005, at 5.33 p.m., American History X became a reality at FCI Phoenix. Earl Kruger never knew that his life would end here. He had just arrived at the prison after being sentenced to 20 years in prison for his role and trying to decimate a mosque with his partner, another leader of the Jewish Defense League, Irv Rubin, in Los Angeles. Rubin gave up while in pretrial detention, believing that his life as he knew it was over. Krugel, a former dental assistant, at his sentencing expressed regret for his actions and claimed to have become a changed man. The judge did not believe him and accused him of promoting hatred in the most vilest way. But hatred would circle back and take his life. At the age of 26 years old, David Frank Jennings had no idea that his life would forever end. On the afternoon of August 14, 2003, David Frank Jennings entered a Bank of America branch in Las Vegas, Nevada, approached a teller and demanded money, stating, put all your money on top of the counter. I have a gun. Just do it now. The teller summoned the bank manager who approached the teller window. Jennings then told the manager, sir, tell her to put the money on the counter. Hurry up. Jennings fled on foot with just over $1,000 in cash. He would later be apprehended thereafter and arrested. He would be sentenced to 63 months with good time. He would be out in less than five years. His release date was April 26, 2008. But today, he's still in prison. That release date wasn't too far away, but this young supremacist wanted no part of the streets. He was a skinhead all the way through, and he learned to hate. At least that's what he thought. Krugel had only been here three days. He was out enjoying the sun and the place that might be his last home. For him, prison sucked, but he believed in his mission and that what he had done was for the good of his people, and if it came with prison, so be it. But there were rumblings on the yard among the white gang-affiliated prisoners, many of them sack gang members, soldiers of Aryan culture. And now, Mr. Jennings. He arrived at FCI Phoenix on July 2, 2004, assigned to Pima unit. He fell in with the white car and white politics, and he felt he had something to prove to those he looked up to. The rumblings had already started among the white convicts, a high-powered Jewish man had arrived. There was a plot to hit Krugel in the shower with some rocks in Yuma unit. The order, according to court documents, was given by prisoner Kenneth Passy, who at the age of 29 years old was serving 10 years for a meth case. He, too, was a skinhead. Some SAC members and skinheads would meet on the prison yard, the faces familiar to prison staff. David Frank Jennings, Richard Cunningham, a 48-year-old Vargos motorcycle gang suspect, serving seven years, Christopher Bach, a SAC gang member serving nine months on a violation, and Kenneth Passy, along with some others. They were all in agreement that the old man who had just arrived three days earlier had to go, and he had to go in a violent way. And as all young impressionable dudes do that wanted to be accepted, David volunteered to do the hit. He had already been disciplined by other white prisoners for doing a tattoo on a black prisoner, and this was his way of getting back into the good graces of the men he thought he wanted to be like. He realized that all he said and all he believed in was violated, 
and he vowed to never again mix his beliefs with making money in prison. There were rumors that Krugel had plotted to get rid of an Odinist church. When the time came, Dave was shaking. He knew he made a promise and now he had to either fulfill it or back out by heading to protective custody, leaving any and all affiliations behind him. The time had came, all the movies he had watched on prison, all the literature he had read about what he now believed in was all before him. David Blackettell, another prisoner, would pat the young Dave on the back, saying, don't worry about a thing, bro. Exactly what he needed. Had the younger man thought about the consequences? And if so, was his allegiance to his crew more meaningful than his freedom? David Jennings, his heart beating fast, walked up behind his intended victim. His prison-made weapon in his hand, three big rocks that he found on the yard. Dave would place them in a yellow laundry net bag, his eyes locked on another prisoner. It was him, the guy he had promised to take care of. He was an old, overweight, balding man, but today he was David's prison prey. The old man was down doing push-ups. With his heart beating fast, he thought for a moment against what he was about to do. But then it happened. The first swing catching the old man on top of his head, the next to the side, and the third swing raised him slightly as he was down on all fours. There was no fighting back. He was out, never knowing what had just hit him. David with a sick smile glamorized in the violence he had just committed. He would drop the yellow bag in a heap at his feet, the weapon of destruction left there unattended as Dave headed towards the barber shop, his deed done. Feet and palms sweating, he would rub his hands together as if he had just accomplished some feat. Another prisoner would walk over to the staff and report that another inmate had just been decimated on the yard. The squawk on the radio radiated on the compound. Ch -ch 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 -ch, we have an inmate down. When staff arrived, Krugel had no pulse. The back of his head was crushed and his jaw appeared fractured. There was profuse bleeding from the back of his head, face and ears, and he was not responsive. The institution was immediately secured as well as the crime scene area. The physician's assistant responded along with Daisy Mountain Fire Department. Inmate Krugel was pronounced dead on the prison yard at an FCI. Once locked down, the prison would do inmate interviews, escorted prisoners to the unit team area where many lined up to let staff know what happened and why. Some looking for a reduction of their own sentences and some just wanting the white gang members off the yard. David Jennings, along with 10 other inmates affiliated with the soldiers of Aryan culture and skinheads, were remanded to the special housing unit pending further investigation. The investigation would reveal some information suggested Christopher Bach and Kenneth Passy, both members of Soldiers of Aryan Culture, instructed and approved Jennings to do the assault on Krugel. Before long, the FBI would have David Jennings in an interview room on November 17, 2005, where he would admit to committing the crime. He volunteered the following information. At the 4.30 p.m. move period earlier in the day, Jennings went to the recreation yard. He played two games of handball with some Mexican inmates on the handball court. Jennings played for 10 to 15 minutes, and then he and the victim exchanged words. He stated the victim called him a punk and said a few choice words. He believed the incident stemmed from an earlier incident that occurred on November 3rd, 2005, where he bumped into the victim in the chow hall during lunch, and they exchanged stares. Jennings stated he left the handball court and walked two laps, counterclockwise. The victim was standing on the edge of the cement near the clip bars and was approximately five feet away when he called Jennings a punk. Jennings stated he was certain the comment was directed to him. He stated the old man told Jennings if he ever bumped into him again, he would kill him. Jennings stated he said to the victim, we'll see who the punk is. Jennings advised that he obtained a brick from the track and put it in his bag, then went back to the dip area where the other inmate was. The other inmate was doing push-ups. Jennings stated, I killed him, hitting him in his head four times with the brick. Jennings stated the victim did not say anything. He stated that he walked away and went to smoke a cigarette, then noticed there was blood on his clothing. Jennings told the authorities that he was a skinhead. He stated he did not know anything about the victim, such as his name or religion. He stated he was not aware he was Jewish. And then Jennings stated that the assault was not planned. It was a spur of the moment thing. Jennings stated the victim was Jewish, that he might now have the issues with the JDL League, the Jewish Defense League. Inmate Jennings was advised of his Miranda warning rights on November 17, 2005 by the FBI. He stated he understood those rights and provided a statement. He volunteered the following information. He said that during the previous interview, the victim had called Jennings a punk, and this was not true. He stated, I have knowledge of who the dude was and what he was. I couldn't let it pass. See, I'm a skinhead. You don't understand. Jennings stated he does not know the victim's actual name. He told the cops he was aware of the victim from television prior to Jennings' arrival at FCI Phoenix. Jennings heard from the news that the victim was part of a plot 
to blow up a white power concert and gathering in California. Jennings heard this on CNN when Jennings was still on the streets in Las Vegas. Jennings saw similar stories about the victim in other media outlets, including newspapers, in addition to white power literature. He stated someone brought it to Jennings' attention who the victim was after the victim arrived at FCI. Jennings will not provide who told him about the victim. The information was provided to Jennings in passing conversation because Jennings is a skinhead. The information was not given to Jennings by a shot caller, and Jennings was not directed or requested to assault the victim by a shot caller. Again, he was lying to the FBI. He stated, I don't get along with shot callers, period. After Jennings was told who the victim was, Jennings recalled the previous news reports regarding the victim. The information was given to Jennings two days before the homicide. Jennings did not tell anyone what he was going to do because he was afraid he would be snitched off. When asked if he regretted what he had done, he would say, no, I don't. I can honestly say, no, I don't regret it. During one of the interviews, another inmate stated he witnessed Dave walk up and hit the old man a couple times on the back of the head with a laundry bag while the old man was doing push-ups. He stated he was passing pictures when all of this happened. Stated he was in shock because he could not believe what Dave had just done. He observed Dave drop the bag and the bag appeared to have a towel inside of it. Then Dave would walk toward the ice machine by the barbershop. And this is when he walked over to some black inmate by the barbershop and told them what had just happened. He also stated he had no problem testifying and identifying Dave as the man behind the carnage. This man wanted a reduction. When it was time for the biker Cunningham to be interviewed, he failed to tell the cops that it was he who had brought the information to the skinheads as to who Krugel was. Instead, he painted a different picture. When interviewed by the FBI, Cunningham stated, I was in the dining facility when the incident happened. I then walked to the yard, observed the section where TVs were empty. I realized that something was wrong because I've been doing time. It just felt something. I just felt like something was wrong. I was told that there was a body laying over in that area. I was walking with other white prisoners and began to walk the track. I looked over and thought the body looked like a Hispanic Paisa inmate. And then an inmate told me it was the old man crew. I could not believe it was him until I got back to the unit and I found out for sure. I know crew from MDC Los Angeles and I also have knowledge about his crimes. I ate and sat with Krugel on a daily basis during the meals, except for the day of the incident, the lunch meal. I was also in the unit in Los Angeles when his cellmate, co-defendant, took his own life. His co-defendant slid his and jumped off the tier. The reason I have knowledge about Krugel's case is because in MDC Los Angeles, everyone had knowledge about each other's case, and we would talk about it openly with each other. Krugel and myself came together and rode here on the bus. I liked the guy. And I don't care what kind of crime he was serving time for. His crime didn't bother me in one bit. I was surprised when I heard the man laying on the ground was Krugel. Actually, I could not believe it. The skinheads in the unit could not believe it and did not understand why Dave would do something like that. On November 8, 2005, inmate Richard Cunningham was interviewed by the FBI and SIS lieutenant. He stated he was a biker and he knew Earl Krugel from MDCLA. He stated Krugel had no other issues at MDC with white inmates or skinheads. He would tell the cops he saw him three times there and was on the bus with him. Cunningham stated he got called to R&D for property. And Cunningham stated he never told staff that Krugel was involved in blowing up a Nazi church. He said he knows what he read in the newspaper, that he was going to blow up a mosque and a congressman. Cunningham ate every meal with Krugel except one. Cunningham stated he had no issues with Krugel during the meals. He stated he would not cooperate with any investigation with the police. Cunningham had gotten himself into a web that he wanted out of but this is how prison works. There are always rules to mind your own business, but so many of these convicts are always in everyone else's business. And the biker brought the information pushing the envelope to have something done to Krugel. But now that it had happened, he wanted no part of it when it got real and raw. Prison politics at their best. In the end, David had threw his life away. He knew he had no wins, so he'd plead guilty to second degree murder. And the federal judge, Michael Liberty, would not hesitate to impose a new sentence of 35 years. His release date now is 2039, when he will be 62 years old, all for a group of nobodies who were centered on bullshit prison politics. How long do you think it was before that shit started to hurt David Frank Jennings? I wonder how long it took for him to be laying up in that cell. He's probably went to the ADX over that, right? Laying up in a cell like, damn, man, these people just gave me 35 more years. No, these people didn't give it to you. You gave it to yourself. You want to go on a dummy mission. You let these people put a battery in your back. At an FCI, you had a couple years left to go home. Remember, he told the police, he said, I don't regret it. No, not at all. I guarantee you that he regrets it now. You know, as you get older, you get wiser. As you get older, you start to realize like, damn, man, 
All this stuff was all for nothing. All them dudes. How about the biker, right? He's the one that came from the from from the MDC, came over to the federal prison. Like, yo, man, that's that dude right there, bro. He pushed the envelope. He pushed the agenda. And now he's talking to the police. Like, man, I don't. I, I, I like the guy. He was a good guy, man. No, nah, man, you ended up getting that dude killed, bro. You got that dude killed. And you got this young kid who they put a battery on his back. Pretty much, you helped get him a life sentence, 35 years. But now you don't want, he was your buddy. You want no part of that. You, I don't know anything. You know, I don't know what, I like that guy. I was eating with him. Yeah, of course. How much money have you sent David Frank Jennings in prison while he's doing that 35 piece? You know, he pushed your agenda, the agenda that you wanted pushed. I'll tell you right now, man. FCI, camps, lows, it could happen anywhere. Prison's always subject to change. There's always somebody dangerous. There's always somebody that don't give a shit. There's always somebody that says, you know what? I don't care about being in prison. I don't care about spending the rest of my life here. And there's some weirdos, man. This kid was a, was a missile. He was a missile. They sent a missile. But yeah, I want to prove myself to you guys. I got in trouble for tattooing a black dude. So, you know, I want to clear my name, brother. You cleared your name. For 35 years. That's what you did. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. We'll catch you guys tomorrow. With respect, we're out.